Hello, I'm Namo Abdullah in Washington and welcome to Inside America. Iraq's Prime Minister was here in Washington last week for the first time ever since the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Iraq. Before saying anything about Maliki's most recent visit, let's take a look back at his previous visit. On December 12, 2011, days before the last U.S. soldier would leave Iraq, Maliki was standing with President Obama who proudly declared that he was bringing a responsible end to a long and costly war in Iraq. Obama did not leave his irresponsible end phrase entirely unexplained. Today I'm proud to welcome Prime Minister Maliki, the elected leader of a sovereign, self-reliant, and democratic Iraq. He also praised Maliki as the leader of the most inclusive government yet. But exactly six days later, upon Maliki's return to Iraq, see what happened. Iraq's vice president, Tariq al-Hashimi, the highest ranking Sunni politician, had to flee to Kurdistan because the Shia lead government sought to arrest him on terrorism charges. Ever since the last U.S. soldier left Iraq, Maliki had been accused of making several other attempts to sideline Sunni and Kurdish politicians. This has made many to describe him as an authoritarian leader who prioritizes his sectarian identity over Iraqi nationalism. This time, here in Washington, things seemed very different as well. Maliki did not receive the kind of warm welcome he was given two years ago. As Iraqis are currently suffering a degree of violence not seen since the darkest days of the sectarian war, Obama did not reiterate his 2011 claim that Iraq was sovereign, self-reliant, and democratic. He did not hold a press conference either to allow reporters to raise questions like these ones. Mr. President, is Maliki still the leader of the most inclusive government in Iraq? Have you really brought a responsible end to the Iraq war? So now what's Obama's policy towards Iraq, a Shia-dominated oil-rich nation where U.S. interests are manifold? After the loss of thousands of American lives and billions of their dollars, can Obama draft a policy that helps Iraq emerge as a decent society for its citizens and a reliable ally for the United States? Well, to discuss this subject, I am joined by two very distinguished people here in Washington. One of them is Zalmay Khalizad, America's former ambassador to Iraq and Afghanistan. The other guest is Clifford May, president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. He's also a journalist who previously served as editor, as a senior editor at the New York Times and Newsweek. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Mr. Khalizad, let me start off with you. Mr. Maliki did not receive the kind of warm welcome he was given two years ago. Some senators even uh, sent a letter to President Obama and accused, accused him of pursuing a sectarian policy, an authoritarian leader. Why is that? What has changed over the past two years? I think the reason for uh, uh, the difference in uh, how he was received, particularly in Congress, uh -huh. uh, was the situation in Iraq. Uh, Iraq is in a very difficult situation uh -huh. uh, right now. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, uh, violence uh, suffered by Iraqis, as you said, mm -hmm. is uh, almost unprecedented. Uh, I think some 1,000 Iraqis have died every month uh, since April. Uh, Al-Qaeda, which uh, was devastated and weakened dramatically uh, in five, six years ago, mm -hmm. uh, has uh, re-emerged with a vengeance. Um, part of uh, the area from Mosul to Anbar is dominated mm -hmm. by Al Qaeda, and even in areas of Baghdad, Al Qaeda is uh, quite strong. Mm -hmm. uh, relations between the central government uh, in Baghdad and, and the Kurdish region, as well as the Sunni areas, mm -hmm. is very difficult. Even some Shia politicians are unhappy so. with the situation. So all of this uh, contributed. Uh, to the to the to the kind of reception that he received, although the, I think with regard to some particular senators, the killings that took place in Ashraf of some of mm -hmm. the Iranian opposition also mm -hmm. played a role uh, in the discussions uh, between the uh, members of Congress, in particular, and Maliki. So, uh, is Maliki uh, to blame for all of these problems that Iraq uh, suffers from? Well, uh, I mean, he's the prime minister, the most powerful figure uh, in Iraq, so. He gets the credit when things go well, and he gets the, the blame uh, for when they don't. But uh, certainly, uh, his relations with uh, some of the other leaders, he can be in part blamed for. He, he's had a hard time working with other uh, leaders, uh, 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 
both uh, in, in the Sunni areas as well as in Kurdistan uh, and even among some of the Shia. So he's, uh, he's had a hard time uh, uh, working with other leaders, developing uh, a, a joint vision, a consensus among key Iraqi forces about uh, the future of Iraq, what needs to be done, and sharing power uh, 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 with others. Uh, Mr. May, let me uh, come to you. Do you also uh, hold Maliki responsible for most of the problems that he described that we've had over the past two years? And if you do, why do you think he's changed so much? Because I remember in 2011, as I said in the set piece, President Obama was praising him, was praising his leadership for the achievements that had been made. Yeah. Well, I think the ambassador is right. When you're the prime minister, th that's where the buck stops with you. And uh, I think there's plenty of reason to criticize him for not having an inclusive government, for not reaching out more uh, to, to, the, uh, to the Sunnis and to the Kurds, and in fact, following policies that could be seen as, mm -hmm. at the very least, divisive. Now, is he alone at fault to, for this? No, of course he's not. And he's had tremendous challenges, not least, of course, mm -hmm. the resurgence, as the ambassador said, of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Mm -hmm following the American withdrawal. And the ambassador is also correct yeah. that it was in 2007, 2008, the surge decimated Al Qaeda. And then President Obama made, a, I think, a, a very serious mistake, believing we could just remove all our troops and everything would be hunky-dory. The prime minister could uh, handle things. Al Qaeda wouldn't seek to reestablish itself. Mm -hmm. And by reestablishing itself in, a, in Iraq, as Al Qaeda has done, because American troops left and Iraqi troops were not yet prepared for that challenge, well, that also meant that those forces that al-Qaeda was reestablishing could pretty quickly spread across the border into Syria, where there was also a power vacuum, because the president, uh, President Obama, had also, two and a half years ago, not supported what I would call the nationalist opposition to let, Assad uh, let, in let Syria. Me, let me pause you for a second. Why did President Obama in 2011 said Iraq was salivary land? Salivary land, that means basically it had yeah. the security apparatuses, it had the police force, the armed force to defend itself. So did he, was he getting wrong intelligence? Was he, he unaware of what right. was happening in Iraq? Uh, you may know better than I, but it, it, was, it, it was one of several mis un bad analyses of the situation. Bad analysis in Syria as well. Remember, two and a half years ago, the Obama administration was saying that Assad's fall was inevitable and needed to happen. They willed the ends, but didn't will the means by supporting it. And the analysis that Assad's end was inevitable was a wrong analysis. The analysis that Iraq w was able to stand on its own two feet, uh, continue to suppress al-Qaeda, and to stand up to Iran next door, that was also a mistake. Look, imagine if the U.S. in 19, early 1946 mm -hmm. had left <coughs> Europe. Imagine if it had left Japan. Would they look as they do today? I'm afraid they would not have. And uh, I think from a historical and policy point of view, uh, this has to be judged as a very serious error. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with him that it was a very serious error to withdraw the troops in 2011? Well, I think so. Uh, I think it was uh, motivated in part by perhaps bad analysis, mm -hmm. but also I think by a, a desire to disengage. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, uh, that, that too, in my view, uh, affected the flowery language used uh, uh, on that occasion. Yeah. And I also agree that the, uh, the, 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 the strategy or the policy uh, towards Syria uh, was, uh, uh, was a problem. The U.S. presence in Iraq worked uh, as a cushion. I think many Iraqis now recognize that not uh, agreeing with the U.S. demand for jurisdiction mm -hmm. over the U.S. troops uh, was a mistake that the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq was a mistake in terms of Iraqi interest. And I think many Americans, some of us argued at the time, but even some of those who didn't uh, support the presence at the time recognize uh, now that uh, that, was a, that was a bad, uh, mm -hmm. bad judgment, a bad mistake. You said Iraq, uh, the United States wants to disengage from Iraq. It seems to me U.S. foreign policy, not only in Iraq, but also in the, in the whole Middle East, is a policy of disengagement. Look right. at Syria. Right. Look at you know uh, Iraq, and look at also the recent detente between Iran and the United States. So, is the United States what? What do you think? What is the policy of the United States in the Middle East? I think that uh, the Obama administration wanted to uh, correct what it saw was excessive 
you, uh, Bush administration reliance on the military instrument uh, in the Middle East. I think it went too far the other way and was anxious to militarily mm -hmm. uh, disengage from <laughs> Iraq. Uh, I believe that now it recognizes uh, that that has gone, that went too far, that Al-Qaeda has become a strategic uh, potentially challenge not only to the uh, Iraqi security, to the regional security, but also potentially to our own, uh, and would like to increase its engagement. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what, uh, what is needed for that challenge to be successfully met mm -hmm. is uh, not only giving arms or intelligence to the Iraqis, uh, it requires changes in uh, Iraqi mindset at, mm -hmm. at the center. Uh, remember the sons of Iraq that fought the, uh, in part Al-Qaeda was as a result of our effort in 2006, 2007, 2008 to engage uh, the Sunni political elite uh, with the central government and with our presence and the efforts <coughs> significantly successful, not completely, to integrate uh, Sunnis into the political and security apparatus uh, is what, what worked. Now, are we willing to uh, to to uh, go back and perhaps renegotiate uh, a presence uh, in Iraq, uh, uh, or the Iraqis willing to give us uh, the jurisdiction that uh, that will require? Uh, Mr. Uh, will let they change policies, the Iraqis, to do what is necessary in terms of? the reintegration, those are the, the big questions uh, that, yeah. uh, that Iraq faces. Should sh I mean, should the U.S. really re reintegrate? I mean, but really, it makes me, when I see this uh, kind of policy of disengagement in Iraq, it makes me think that Iraq is not important for the United States. Is, uh, is Iraq important, and what are the important, the, if it is, if there is any importance attached to Iraq for the U.S., can you tell me about it? Well, I, look, I do think Iraq is important for the United States, mm -hmm. and I do think it was a mistake, and maybe this is going a little far, but to abandon Iraq a few years ago, certainly militarily. I think it was a mistake for the Obama administration to say, I think this is premature, we're going to pivot towards Asia, because that meant we we're going to pivot away from the Middle East mm -hmm. at a time when the Middle East is in great crisis. Mm -hmm. Too much of Obama's policy, I would argue, has been built on wishful thinking, wishful thinking that Iraq was able to stand up to both al-Qaeda and Iran at a time when it wasn't. Wishful thinking in terms of Syria, that Assad was going to fall without any need for uh, American action. A wishful thinking right now in terms of Iran, uh, the detente you mentioned. I think it's wishful thinking that we have detente with Iran or that these negotiations are going to go well for the U.S. Uh, the new president, uh, Hassan Rouhani, um, I do not believe that he's a moderate. I think he may be a pragmatist, but I think he believes that he can beat the U.S. in these negotiations, and I fear that he's quite right. Um, and I'm very nervous about what's going to happen over the next few di few days when the it's negotiations. We will resume. definitely get back to also Iran relations. But I'd like to now ask you both of you a question. Maybe start with you. It seems like w what the president is doing, this disengagement in the Middle East, is exactly what the American people want him to do. Mm -hmm. Look well, at the polls, like more than 60 percent, according to most of the polls, including the conservative ones, want American, they don't want Americans to bomb Syria. They support the uh, end of the Iraq war. And con even Congress, you know, is very hesitant about intervening in another Middle East war. I quite hear you. Mm. A president is elected to be a leader not to follow polls. The president is elected to make the case for what's necessary, not what's convenient. No question that Americans are war weary, no question that Americans are fed up and frustrated with the Middle East, and there's a lot of good reason for them to do so. But anybody who studies the subject with a little bit of intensity can see that there is there are tremendously important American interests in this area. There is a need for engagement, a need for American leadership. There is no substitute for that other than the anarchy we're seeing. And so it's really up to the president to make the case as a leader to the American people. Here's why we're going to be engaged in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in with, in, in, with, in, with Iran. Here's what's at stake. Here's why it could get a lot worse, and here's what I'm, we have to do and what I'm asking you to do. And if the president would do that, I think he would probably be successful. Americans can rise to the occasion. They're not that tired. But he has not done so. On the, on the contrary, as we've discussed, he has sort of said, we don't need to be so engaged in the Middle East. We're, we're probably a big part of the problem. Let's turn towards Asia. And by the way, we're not doing anything very useful in Asia that I can see either. President Obama uh, often says that we need to do some nation building at home. 
Do you agree with him? Oh, sure, but, uh, but uh, there is not a question of a zero-sum game that we can attend to our own problems, and we have some serious issues here at home. There's no question about that, getting our economic house in order is very important. Uh, but we have uh, uh, important interests uh, as the leading power in the world in that region. You asked what's, what are our interests in, in Iraq. I mean, two interests uh, that uh, I think we have a consensus on. No one will dispute those. We have an interest that al-Qaeda doesn't find a, a sanctuary in the heart of the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, and that's what uh, the situation is heading towards. We have an interest in uh, uh, an oil flowing out of Iraq and the region. The world economy is, uh, still depends on it, although our relative dependence has declined ourselves, but it's a one market uh, globally. So. Uh, uh, it, we have uh, important <coughs> interests, uh, and we don't want, obviously, a hostile hegemony over the region, which is another uh, problem. There is the problem of uh, uh, nuclear proliferation, Iran's uh, uh, program that Clifford was referring to. So there is uh, we, no one would challenge that these are important interests. The question is, uh, what does we want to do about it? What are, what are the appropriate objectives and strategies and policies? Both Al-Qaeda and oil that you mentioned were also mentioned in a joint statement by President Obama and Nouri al-Maliki last week. They said they need to cooperate on those issues. And the statement also added that uh, the United States will provide Iraq with uh, military assistance it, it asked the United States, including Apache helicopters, uh, even the F-16s that it has bought. So the, there, here another question like Iraqis might ask, because President, Prime Minister Maliki is widely described as a sectarian man, somebody who pursues the interests of his Shia group rather than the, the, the interests of all the people of Iraq. If you provide him with this kind of heavy weaponry, isn't there a fear that he might use it against not just Al-Qaeda, but all, against the, all the Sunnis, against the Kurds? Well, the question is uh, uh, that uh, in terms of weapons, I don't know whether in terms of timing, mm. all the things that you said uh, are going to be rapidly provided. I think that, that there is a commitment to cooperate against Al-Qaeda by providing information and more intelligence uh, sharing. I think the Prime Minister wasn't very pleased uh, with the pace of uh, discussions and provision of actual but weapons I'm such afraid, as Mr. Khaliza, like uh, what can the United States do even if the Prime Minister of Iraq seeks to arrest the Vice President of Iraq who is a Sunni the highest Sunni ranking politician what but, can it do it can't well, do anything but, uh, that, 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 that is correct but uh, for that uh, the Prime Minister of Iraq did not need F-16s or uh, helicopter gunships I think yeah, it's but, already but, but decided don't you think that the, 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 if you well but let me answer mm -hmm. the, the first question <laughs> uh, but uh, with regard to the provision of arms I think he has been frustrated that the US is not moving fast enough to provide them with helicopters so he's contracted to get helicopters from Russia mm. and I think with regard to the F-16s he's been frustrated that it has been uh, taken uh, much too long uh, for them to get those but those weapons alone, even if he had them, which I think will take time, even if he receives them, uh, 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 will not be sufficient and effective in dealing with the problem of, of al-Qaeda and terrorism. Mm -hmm. you, need a, you need a strategy, a policy that includes the Sunnis, in the case of al-Qaeda, into the political process so they would cooperate uh, in, the, in a marginalizing and uh, responding to the al-Qaeda threat. Mr. May, do you think the inclusion of the Sunnis, as he mentioned, and the Kurds in the government is a precondition for the United States to help Prime Minister Maliki? Yeah, I think there should be any number of precond preconditions uh, to additional military aid. You don't want those helicopters being used against the Kurds. You don't want them being used against uh, Sunnis who are not part of al-Qaeda. Um, and there are various ways that you want to both trust and verify that that's not going to happen if you're going to provide that, ki that kind of aid. Um, so you want preconditions, and I think as the ambassador is suggesting, you want incremental, uh, to, to bring the aid in in an incremental way, just as we should have withdrawn mm -hmm. more incrementally, a little at a time, over time, to make sure that, in fact, uh, Iraq uh, had a government that, could, that, that was inclusive and that was increasingly democratic and was able to stand up to its, uh, its enemies. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Maliki offered that he can help a uh, mediating role between the United States and Iran. Does the United States need him for that? 
I, I'm, I'm dubious that, he, that the United States uh, does need him for that or that he could play that role very well. His relations with Iran um, are tricky as well. I think he genuinely would like to see uh, Iraq um, enjoy sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's what the Iranian regime has in mind for Iraq over time. I think they see very much Iraq as doing its bidding, as a, as a, as a, a, a sort of a client state. Uh, just as I think uh, Syria, should Assad prevail, will be absolutely a client state, not to say a satrapy of, uh, of, of, per of Persia. So I think they should be very cautious about using him. I think they should be cautious about using uh, Turkey's uh, Erdogan for this purpose. I think, there are, I think they need to look very carefully at Rouhani, who he has been, his history, at the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, what his history has been, mm -hmm. and have a realistic view of who they're negotiating with. And, I'm, and I fear that's not the case right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Khalizad, I know you've been to uh, Kurdistan a lot. You've been, you, were, you were the ambassador in Iraq. Uh, like you have a lot of uh, things that the Kurdistan regional government and Baghdad dispute about. And the United States seems to take uh, a position that's more in support of Baghdad on many of those issues. Do you agree with me? Or if not, can you explain? Well, I think uh, that the U.S. is fearful of uh, what uh, it sees uh, disintegrating Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, by not uh, implementing federalism as envisaged in the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, it specifies what authorities belong to the center, what authorities mm -hmm. belong uh, to the region, uh, the chances that Iraq will disintegrate into chaos increases. Mm -hmm. And I think th here there is uh, both an analytic and therefore a policy uh, consequence that comes from it. Uh, that rather than a stronger center as such, uh, that, it, uh, that a more decentralized Iraq, w based on the Constitution, uh, is what can keep Iraq together and avoid chaos. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, uh, if federalism is not made to work mm -hmm. between the c Kurds and the Arabs in the first instance, and maybe eventually having regions emerge in the Sunni area so the Sunnis can take responsibility more for their area and in the fight against Al-Qaeda. Uh, the, the chances of Iraq descending into chaos and integration and Kurds perhaps looking to alternatives uh, for looking after their interest and their security and their prosperity would increase. So I think there is a, there is a, 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 a need for some adjustment in thinking in Washington on this issue of uh, the requirements for making Iraq work. And that does not mean that uh, Baghdad is always right. Uh, mm -hmm. And tilting towards Baghdad is the right policy. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have your view on, on that as well. Do you think Baghdad is, uh, the, the United States is right when it uh, openly supports Prime Minister Maliki? For example, it, the State Department, in official statements, we've seen opposition towards the unilateral oil contract that the Kurdistan regional government has signed with foreign companies, including ExxonMobil of the United States. I'm not sure I understand why the U.S. government needs to involve itself at, at, at that level. Mm. It seems to me that's, uh, that's internal politics, internal economics of the country, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure why that's, that's helpful to, uh, to, to anybody. We'll be back to discuss this subject further, but now I need to take a short break. There is now a renewed dispute between the autonomous Kurdistan region and Maliki's government in Baghdad over oil. Baghdad and Kurdistan have long had disputes over oil-rich territories such as Kirkuk, which different ethnic groups there consider part of their historical land. After this brief, brief commercial break, we will return to discuss the Obama administration's approach towards these domestic Iraqi disputes. Stay with us. Hello again and welcome back to Inside America. Uh, Mr. Khalizad, uh, I would like to ask you a question about uh, the recent oil dispute we have in Kurdistan. Now a pipeline is being completed between Turkey and Kurdistan and Baghdad. Doesn't like that, has objected to that strongly. Uh, what, I mean, I would like to understand wha what uh, do these disputes, what kind of role do they play in U.S.-Iraq ties? 
Well, as I said before, uh, uh, the U.S. has uh, two interests uh, in this regard. One is mm -hmm. that it would like to see as much oil as possible mm -hmm. come out of Iraq because mm -hmm. that increases the supply mm -hmm. and therefore has a positive effect in terms of keeping the prices low, mm -hmm. positive in terms of the effect on the global economy. The, on the other hand, it doesn't want chaos and conflict uh, between KRG and the uh, uh, government in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. has been trying to uh, uh, work uh, an agreement mm -hmm. perhaps on revenue sharing, uh, perhaps this pipeline that is uh, being built, uh, joining with the existing pi pipeline at a certain uh, uh, stage, and try to also bring together uh, 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 Baghdad and Ankara, so that uh, there is, uh, there, uh, it is sort of problem avoidance is the policy of the Obama administration to the, since it doesn't want to get too involved, particularly if there is security demands, and, and, and uh, uh, that is the case. But I think the, uh, uh, as Clifford said, uh, the U.S. interest is for more oil to come out, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Uh, interest is not to work, uh, to get involved in the details of how that oil comes out, whether there's a parallel pipelines or pipelines that are connected, those are issues for the, yeah. for the parties to, 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 to work it out themselves. But we have an interest in as much oil as possible coming out of Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. May, recently there was a report by the Truman uh, uh, National Security Project, uh, and that report was about the significance of Kurdistan-Turkey relations for the United States. It was published like a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it suggested that Kurdistan, that relationship, the United States can use it as a leverage, as a card to play against Baghdad whenever Baghdad, for example, uh, is doing a policy that is at odds with that of the United States, like in Syria. For example, Iraq is supporting the president, uh, the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. Do you believe that? Well, I'm not sure. I don't, look, I don't think we should be using leverage against Baghdad as, as such. I think we have an interest in Baghdad becoming a functioning government and Iraq becoming a functioning democracy mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and a place that, uh, where we can be proud that our involvement there had a beneficial effect. We want to see uh, Iraq as sovereign and independent and not controlled by any of its neighbors. And I worry mostly about Iran mm -hmm. because I think Iran has uh, aspirations and ambitions for hegemony in the region. And uh, I think that's a, a very serious national security threat in the region and to the United States as well. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has important relations with Turkey. So I think Turkish relations with uh, Kurdistan um, are, are also the better if they're getting along well as they have been. The Kurds have grievances against the Turks, no question about it. Better for those to be resolved peacefully, also uh, obvious. And it's a, a critical time now because you do have in Syria mm -hmm. Um, the Kurdish section of, the, of that country um, having autonomy, if not virtual independence. Mm -hmm. And um, that has, that's going to have ramifications for the future for, for, for the Middle East and, for, and certainly for the other Kurdish areas uh, of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all very important because uh, among the interests I think the United States has is that minorities in the Middle East um, get, to con get to survive. And that means Kurds, that means Druze, that means Christians who are under attack in many countries now, and the Kurds um, perhaps alone are giving refuge to Christians, as we know. Uh, it means Israel, which is our um, America's ally and which is under threat from Iran. So there's all sorts of moving parts, and it's very complicated, um, but I think the U.S. is on the side of, of, of those who want to see peaceful resolutions of these disputes and want to see sovereignty and self-determination for the peoples of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. There have uh, been uh, some attempts to improve relations between Baghdad and Ankara, and that was welcomed in the uh, joint statement uh, issued by the White House and the Iraqi government uh, by Prime Minister Maliki and President Obama. Uh, but my question is, uh, can Baghdad and Kurdistan region be allies with Turkey at the same time? Because the rela Turkey is... Uh, like what basically Turkey is doing in Kurdistan in terms of oil and uh, uh, that Baghdad doesn't like any of those things. Mm -hmm. Baghdad may not like those things, but I, I would say that 
yes, Turkey and Baghdad can have good relations, and there can be good relations between both with the Kurdish areas of Iraq. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, as the ambassador has said, for the Kurds to be reasonable uh, in terms of the of revenue sharing. Um, on the other hand, they should un they, that does not mean giving up all the revenues uh, to Baghdad. Mm -hmm. so maybe there should be some settlement of that, and it shouldn't be beyond the realm of diplomatic negotiations for mm -hmm. Kurdistan and uh, Arab uh, Iraq to, to come to some terms over that. One hopes that that can happen. If not, then I think the, the future of Iraq is very much in doubt. Well, first, I think on the question of Turkish uh, relations with Baghdad and Erbil, I think the, uh, uh, the mindset in the Middle East, which is it's all, everything is zero sum, needs to change. Mm -hmm. I think it's possible that, uh, as Clifford said, that you can have good relations with Baghdad, which Turkey needs right now because of the difficulties in Syria. A lot of its goods that are uh, shipped or uh, transported mm -hmm. to uh, the Gulf by Syria now has to go, they would like to send it to Iraq, so they have some real reasons for wanting to mm. improve relations with Baghdad. But at the same time, I think they have made it clear to uh, Erbil that that will not be done at the expense of the relations between Ankara and Erbil. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I think that Turkey uh, can have good relations with both. On this issue, uh, of Turkish uh, relations with Iraq, uh, I think there has been a revolution in, uh, in uh, Turkish relations uh, with Iraq in the sense that 10 years ago uh, it was very much opposed to U.S. intervention. It was opposed to federalism even in Iraq, to the emergence of uh, autonomous Kurdistan. And now you uh, can see the best of relations mm -hmm. almost in the region is between Ankara and Erbil uh, okay. in part. So it means that people can adjust uh, their relations based on interest uh, and change situation. Mm -hmm. And I think there was a period where uh, Ankara played quite a significant role in, for example, in the previous government formation effort, Ankara also was quite active, uh, as the United States was, as Iran also was after the last uh, election. Uh, but uh, more recently, because of in part Syria and because of improved relations between Ankara and Erbil uh, relations with Baghdad and personal relations mm -hmm. between Maliki and Erdogan mm -hmm. soured. Uh, but I think there is some effort to mend that. I wouldn't take these things as uh, permanent. The, as situation changes, nations do adjust, and that's what you would expect. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but I believe <coughs> that, that the relationship between the KRG and, 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 uh, and Turkey has had a strategic shift. Uh, where the, 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 uh, but I think it's the interest of KRG to have relations with others as well, not to be only reliant on Turkey, Turkey being as important as it is, but it's mm -hmm. the same applies obviously to the other, to, 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 to Turkish strategy towards the region. Definitely, and it's not in Iraq that Turkey wants to increase its leverage, it's throughout the Middle East. You see right. it's aggressively calling for intervention in Syria, and it's really seeking regional dominance in, in, uh, in the Middle East. But recently we saw uh, John Kerry in Saudi Arabia. He said Saudi Arabia can play the regional power. Do you think Saudi Arabia is a candidate for that, or it's Turkey? It's rather Turkey. I, I, look, I think it's a competition right now, and to an extent it's a competition for leadership of the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no question that Iran's rulers think that as a, and a powerful nation uh, with oil and possibly uh, on the way to developing nuclear weapons, they should be playing that role. That's what their revolution was about in 1979. It was not just an Iranian revolution. It was meant to be a global revolution and change the entire world order. I think um, Turkey also looks at the, around the, the region and the world and says, you know, the last great Islamic empire was based here in this country. The next one should be as well. I think there's a touch of neo-Ottomanism to Erdogan. And then I certainly think there are plenty of Arabs who think, well, no, if uh, Arab, Arabs uh, obviously should lead the Islamic world, who else would do it but us? The Saudis, uh, because it's a relatively small country, it doesn't have a strong military, um, th for them to lead as a, and, or rule, uh, that may be more than they actually aspire to. On the other hand, they are a major economic power because of their oil resources. And they feel, and I think this is an important part of it, very, very threatened 
by Iran and its hegemonic uh, ambitions for the region. They realize that Iran is as much of a threat to them, to the Saudis, as it is to Israel, or by the way to Azerbaijan, or by the way to Kuwait, or the United Arab Emirates. And I think there's a lot of anger by the Saudis at this point and frustration at the United States for its passivity in Syria and for not standing up to the Iranians as the Saudis have on many occasions uh, hoped that the U.S. would. So it's a very complex dynamic right now in terms of who's going to lead the region and who's going to lead mm -hmm. an ascendant Islam. Syria seems to be really changing the, the events very fast and dramatically. But after a, another short commercial break, we will come back to discuss this subject further. So uh, is there anything that the United States can do to help emerge Iraq as a decent society for its people and a reliable ally for the United States? Stay with us shortly after the break. We will be back to dig deeper on this issue and some other issues and ask whether President Obama can, play a more, can pay more attention to Iraq. Hello again and welcome back to Inside America. Mr. Khalizad, before the break, Mr. May mentioned Syria. And, and over Syria, Iraq has, has taken a foreign policy that's much closer to Iran than that of the United States. We mentioned that earlier. It has openly supported President Bashar al-Assad. And uh, I mean, I want to ask is whether that's a big worry here in Washington. Well, I think that uh, uh, there is a concern, certainly has been, with regard to the s central government's policy uh, towards uh, Syria, which uh, some would say that is a kind of an access of Iran, Maliki mm -hmm. government, uh, Bashar Assad and Hezbollah, mm -hmm. and that, uh, uh, that uh, on the one hand, and then you have other forces that are trying to work on the other side of the problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but practically, of course, there are th three policies uh, coming out of Iraq as on so many issues because of the lack of consensus uh, inside Iraq, uh, that you have probably the KRG favoring the Kurds uh, remaining together mm -hmm. and neutral between the opposition and the government in Syria. And you have Sunnis who are disaffected by uh, uh, the policies that of the government in Baghdad who favor the opposition or elements of the opposition. So you have uh, 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 in, in Washington dealing with the, with the Baghdad the especially enabling or allowing the flights, overflights uh, mm -hmm. uh, over uh, Iraqi territory by Iran as, as a big issue. Although, as you know, Maliki says they are neutral in the fight. They, they don't favor one side or the other. But practically, of course, we know that the Iranian overflights have been taking place that support in support of, mm -hmm. of, of Bashar. Mm -hmm. As he said, like Iran has shipped weapons to Syria through Iraq. I would like to ask you a question whether, like the position that Iraq is taking regarding Syria, whether it's, as Iraqis themselves say, as Maliki's government says, it's out of security concern of Iraq rather than from, out of pressure from Iran. I, what, what, I, do you, I, what do you make of that? I suspect it's, it's some of both. both. I mean, on the one hand, I think it would be, uh, if Iran needs, is asking for help in supporting Assad in terms of getting weapons, and by the way, Iran has also sent troops, in fact, elite troops from the Quds Force mm -hmm. of the Pasteran of the uh, uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Force and has brought in Hezbollah from Lebanon as fighters on the ground and they've made a big difference. Very hard, it seems to me, for Maliki to say, I'm not going to cooperate with you. Mm -hmm. Just go away, don't ask me to. Uh, by the same token, um, at this point, Maliki also knows that some of the most important forces in Syria are forces that straddle the border into his country. Again, ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, as they call themselves, and, uh, among the, the two most important, the other being uh, al-Nusra Front, Jabhat al-Nusra. So he can't, he, can't be, uh, uh, he can't be blithe about that. He wants to see them defeated. Um, so he's, in a, he's, he's caught yeah. between, Iraq is caught between a, a rock and a hard place in, 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 in this instance. And of course they have the U.S. saying, we don't want you to be helping Iran in this instance. And he's, and he's, I'm sure he's saying to Obama, then you have to give me the means to resist because I don't have them right now. I don't have a very strong army because yeah. guess what happened? 
the army that preceded was dissolved by the U.S. when it came here. Now mm -hmm. it was a Sunni-dominated army, not a Shia-dominated army. Mm -hmm. So it's a complex equation, and again, without it's supporting Maliki, I'm saying it's, he's in a difficult uh, it's position. It's very complex, and there seems to be a lot of dilemmas as well. I mean, Iraq is definitely not a, not a good country for its citizens, at least Baghdad and the South. Yes. You know, the, July was the most violent month. In, in five years, more than 1,000 people died. So the question is, is there something that the Obama administration can do to save Iraq? Hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I would argue that saving Iraq and stabilizing and Iraq turning it into is a U.S. ally, too. I mean, it doesn't seem to be the kind of U.S. ally that the United States hoped with well, the and invasion if you of Iraq. And if you abandon a country as quickly as we did, that that's what's going to happen. I don't think Obama thought it was necessary uh, to do that, to establish uh, and, and, and invest uh, in Iraq. Um, because I think he thought the, the war there that President Bush prosecuted was so ill-conceived and wrong-headed that he simply wanted to get out of it. And I think that's a mistake. So you think it was irresponsible? Yeah, I, what, I think, what I think the U.S. needs to be thinking of and hasn't, and I think it's a, it's, it's a big problem, is a, a, is a regional strategy that's, that, yes, sees Iraq as for what it could be, not what it is, which is, and by, listen, in some ways it has been the most democratic and free country in the, in the Arab and, and Middle East, but it's in very much in jeopardy now. I think we need a regional strategy. We need a regional strategy that I opposes the forces of jihadism, and, uh, and that, whether they are sh Shia or Sunni. And at this moment, we do not have a regional strategy and uh, that's lacking. And until we do, we're not going to be able to shore up Iraq or make sure that Jordan is secure or make sure that Israel is secure or have a good relationship with the Saudis or the Azeris. Mm -hmm. the, the region is in flux, and we are not playing a leadership role. Uh, Mr. Khalizad, I mean, listening to both of you makes me like, conclude that uh, you don't believe that uh, President Obama has brought a responsible end to the Iraq war. Well, what I can mean, be done to reverse that, if you believe so? I think that uh, uh, the U.S. can still uh, uh, influence developments, uh, but for that uh, to happen, it needs to have a clear objective and then a strategy uh, for it. Uh, and I think the strategy is not only Iraq, but uh, as, as Clifford was saying, you need a regional strategy mm -hmm. for it. I think uh, uh, Maliki needs, uh, Iraq needs the U.S. Uh, help and support, uh, and therefore the support has to be linked uh, not only uh, to the regional policies, but also to what uh, happens internally in Iraq. To make federalism in Iraq, help federalism work uh, in Iraq is one. All of Iraq is not negative. Uh, I think the Kurdish region is doing relatively well, has done relatively well. It's go, uh, growing quite rapidly economically. It has become a safe haven uh, to uh, 220,000 uh, Syrian refugees. Uh, it's bec uh, more than 20,000 Christian families since 2004 have taken refuge there. Uh, 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 that is a success story uh, in itself, what's happened in the, Kurdish, uh, in the Kurdistan region. Uh, uh, but what uh, the key thing is now the election that's coming in Baghdad uh, in April national election. Mm -hmm. It's important that the U.S. maintains contacts not only with uh, Maliki. I think the other region uh, leaders of Iraq needs to be engaged. They should be invited also to Washington, including the president of Kurdistan region, uh, Sunni leaders, other Shiite leaders. We need to think uh, 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 to have an inclusive national government uh, in the aftermath of the coming election with a policy that, uh, as I said before, um, uh, gives all communities a stake in success uh, of the government that all can see themselves in the picture. If that doesn't happen, if current trends continue, if security worsen, uh, and not only it will enable al-Qaeda, and we will have a strategic problem, a strategic opportunity in Iraq would have turned into a strategic problem, mm -hmm. but also I think uh, the future of Iraq uh, will be, uh, as, a, as a single entity, uh, uh, mm -hmm. will, be, will, be, uh, will be questioned and there will be pressures uh, for, uh, to, to, for the disintegration of the country, which will, uh, which will, be a ch uh, will have a transformative effect on the region as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mr. May, when Maliki came to Washington, some people believed that the, the main 
uh, reason behind his visit was to convince Washington that uh, he sh uh, to, to get some political support from Washington to um, run for a third term. Do you think he will get that support from Washington? Well, I think he's. I think that is among the reasons he's here, and I think he needs some political support. And I think he. Uh, I think the the evidence suggests he's thinking of a third term, and it's not assured that he'll get one. Um, how much support he'll get? Will it be enough? Uh, I don't. I can't say. I know internal Iraqi like politics judging Maliki well enough. Uh, over the past the past two terms that he's run Iraq, like as an expert who have seen him from Washington, do you think he should be given that support? Uh, the question in politics always is, what is the alternative? And I'm not sure what that what that is right now. Uh, Maliki is not the ideal leader, mm -hmm. um, but we have very few ideal leaders in the world these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I'll, uh, uh, in any, in any de democratic society, the question always is, what are the options, what are the alternatives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's the key thing is that uh, 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 to be broadly engaged, not to, I mean, it's easier to work with one leader, obviously, mm -hmm. that makes life much easier in a sense. But I think for this uh, next phase, uh, given that the national election is coming, the ne U.S. needs to have broad engagement uh, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, as I said, not only mm, mm, Prime Minister Maliki, he's the Prime Minister, has been working with the U.S. for some time. What do you mean by broad engagement? Do you mean like uh, he has to engage at regional levels? Like he has, they have, to, the United States has to engage with Kurdistan region separately from Baghdad and s with the Sunnis separate from the Shias? Is that I the think point that you're the, making? I mean, Iraq has got uh, 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 political leaders, mm -hmm. uh, and it is a parliamentary system. And uh, no party uh, has or is likely to have an, uh, the necessary votes by itself mm -hmm. to govern. So there has to be horse trading, uh, an agreement on a uh, national government, on a program, on a president. Uh, 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 there has to be a new president uh, of Iraq. And there has to be a new prime, uh, prime minister after the election, head of parliament. So given the parliamentary nature of the system, the U.S. engagement has to reflect the political reality that there are parties uh, with bases of their own. And the U.S. needs to engage all of them, all the key leaders of Iraq, and play a positive role in encouraging the formation of a government that can address the challenges that Iraq faces, which is to be more inclusive. To make, uh, to make federalism work to, in terms of relations between Kurds and Baghdad and between Sunnis and Baghdad, and among the Shia too, because uh, not all Shia parties are on the same page. Uh, so I uh, rather focus on a broad engagement rather than an exclusive or a single point engagement. That doesn't mean one shouldn't engage Prime Minister Maliki or listen to him and, and deal with him as, as the Prime Minister of the country. I'd like to ask both of you one question, but please answer me in one word because I have no time left. Uh, are you hopeful that the Obama administration will pay some more attention to Iraq? Uh, yeah, I'm hopeful. That doesn't mean confident. I think it will pay attention, more attention, because of the th increasing threat of Al Qaeda and because of the energy concern. Mr. Zalman Khalizad, former ambassador of the United States to Iraq and Afghanistan, thank you so much for talking to, to Rudaw. Cliff uh, May, thank you, uh, the president of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, thank you so much for talking to us as well. Dear viewers, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, be well.